Now we're moving from, I don't know, wisdom to inspiration maybe. One of the famous friends of Skövde, you're back. Rami Ismail, thanks so much for coming to Sweden Game Conference this year. Thanks for traveling. It's great to have you back. Uh, your, your headline is the Rami talk. <laughs> so <laughs> how about that? It doesn't get any better than that. It's, it's, uh, it's so great to have you. I have a story. Um, that I find really inspirational. And it's from when you first started coding and you dis discovered the magic of code, right. where you could take something and change it, and yeah. how that made it possible to make something new in the world. Can I ask you to share that story? Yeah, no, the, the first line of code I ever wrote was when I was six years old. We had an old MS-DOS computer, and on that computer was uh, QBasic old programming language, and uh, one of the tutorial files was a video game called Gorillas. The only way to boot up that game was to load up the code, and I didn't understand any of the words that were on the screen. I was Dutch, I didn't speak English. Um, but I played that game a lot, and one day I, I went through the code and I saw the title text, Microsoft Gorillas, and I just deleted that, and I just typed in my own name. I didn't know any other, any other thing to write. When I booted up the game again, obviously the game said, Rami Ismail, and I kind of been chasing that feeling ever since, just like you can type things and then games happen. So, yeah, it was kind of set in stone when I was six that wow. I'd be a game developer. Your, your destiny was, was laid right. out. Excellent. Thanks so much, Rami. Look forward to hearing your talk. Big hand! Hi. So, um, my name is Rami Ismo. I'm a game developer. I used to start all my talks with the same line because I get a little nervous before I start talking. So I used to always say, hi, my name is Rami Ismo. I'm one half of Dutch Independent City of Lambeer. My Dutch Independent City of Lambeer shut down in 2020, uh, so I can't use that line anymore. So I'm still sort of improvising on how I start my talk. So instead, I just did this shit. It was fun. Uh, and now I'm going to shut up about me because I don't want to talk about me. I kind of want to talk about y'all. Um, because they asked me to do a talk. And I said, okay, sure, we'll do a talk. And I asked, what's the audience? And they said, well, it's going to be partially students, it's going to be partially industry. And like, that is the least defined group of people you can possibly give me. It's just like, there's people that make games in some way, shape, or form at this event. So I thought long and hard about what talk I wanted to do, what kind of talk I wanted to come up with, and I realized that maybe I should just not. Maybe I should just not come up with anything. Maybe what we should do is we figure out a talk. And then I give that talk. So when I thought about that, I thought, you know what, that might be a good idea. Because the th best thing I can teach you is not to give you answers or solutions. The best thing I can teach any developer is to ask. Ask questions. Tell other people what they're worried about, nervous about, what they're thinking about, what issues they're having. So this talk is really simple. You tell me what goes on 10 empty slides, I'll give that talk, okay? I'm going to need your help, though, because I am not exaggerating. There's literally absolutely nothing in this entire presentation. So if you can tell me Something that you want me to talk about. I can talk about pretty much every part of game development. Please don't ask any very specific art questions. I'm terrible at drawing. Do not ask about how I draw a cow. Um, but anything else. And if you all stay quiet, this is going to be a very short talk. Water. Water? <laughs> There's water there. Do you want me to throw you one? <laughs> I can talk about water if you want. Uh, anything game development related, anything you're worried about, anything that's stuck in your life, anything that you want to be better at. Yeah, go ahead. Funding. funding. Oh my God. Initial funding. Okay. Anybody else? In the back. Oh gosh. This is getting a really rough talk right from the start. We're going hard. This is a hardcore talk already. I don't know how I'm going to transition between those two, but it's going to be fun. Anybody else? Uh, yeah, there in the front. Motivation. Wow, we're really going hardcore on this one. Does anybody have like a fun topic? 
Uh, there in the, oh, you just lowered your hand when I said fun. Okay, give me, give me it anyway. <laughs> okay. Okay. You know what? How about we make this something, how about we make this more positive? How do we say like healthy work environment? <laughs> just to like break it up a little. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Best part of game, aww. Not crunch, okay. Why, why, oh my god, okay, you know what, I don't like how that looks. There we go. There's a lot of people over there, there, yep, there we go. Visual scripting. Yeah, I guess I, uh, yeah, okay. I guess we could talk about that. The, the problem is I, I'm not, I don't like it very much. So it's scripting, sure. Okay. I saw a hand over there. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you. Favorite game. Ah, uh, we're getting to lighter territories. Okay, what's the next one? Just bankruptcy? Uh, yeah? Portfolios, okay. Uh, can I just turn it into getting into the industry? Okay, number 10. All right, all the way at the back. Optimization for low-end devices? Okay. It's kind of a weird ending. <laughs> right, how about this? We'll put that in the QA at the end. Deal? If I don't get to you at the QA at the end, just come punch me after the talk. Somebody else that is like just an ending, like a, yeah, a, con a conclusion. Oh no. Okay, right, what's, the, what's the worst that could happen, right? Hi, my name is Rami Ismail, I'm a game developer. Uh, I've worked on lots of stuff, but I don't really want to talk about me. We're doing a talk jam. We've done this stuff. Money. This is a fun thing about being a game developer is that no matter how many games you make, whenever you stand in front of any audience of students, the first question is always, how do I make money with this thing that just happened to me? And I understand that. I was, I was raised Arab, right? My father is an Arab, my mom is Dutch. And in Arab culture, there's really four jobs you can take, right? You can be a doctor, you can be a lawyer, you can be an engineer, or you can be in disgrace to the family. Those are kind of your four jobs, right? So from when I was a kid, it was always understood that I need to make money for a job to be real. And then you become an artist. A creative, you become a game developer. You go into game development. Who here is a game developer because they want to get filthy rich? Nice, yeah. Very few people get into games to get filthy rich. And the, solution, the reason for that is very simple. The talents that you have in game development will earn more money under better circumstances in almost any other industry where you can apply those talents. If you're a programmer, please go into banking, right? Stable, I hear it's great pay. Uh, artists can be architects, right? Uh, sound designers can work on movies, which they're striking now, but at least they've got a union. That's nice. Um, money always is the question, right? And when it comes to initial funding, there are a few things. When, when it comes to funding your own studio, there are a few things that are useful to know that I think, um, that I think really help. The first one is that when you're looking for funding, a lot of people think that what they're talking about is still video games. And you kind of need to get that out of your system. When you're talking about funding, when you're talking about money, you're talking about money. Which means that what you want to present to the people that are funding you, what you want to talk about to the people that are funding you, is not how great your game is going to be, it's how it's going to make them more money than they're giving you. And this is a mistake I see a lot, and it's a mistake that a lot of people make because they think that investors invest in games, but investors invest in businesses. 
Those businesses happen to make a game. And sure, they might have a bit of understanding about video games, but really what investors know about is business plans, it's burn rates, it's org charts, it's making sure that the investment they make will come back in any way that makes them more money than they're giving you, right? So the first step when you're looking for any funding at all is take a step back from your game, your game design, and look at your business. And the business is a completely different subject, right? When it comes to business, there's three things I tell everybody that they need to get right. The first one, how are you going to make money? The second one is what risks do you pose? And this is a very important question that I'll get back to in a second. The third one is what opportunities do you offer? Because ultimately, investment is a balance between opportunity and risk. Now, risk is a strange one, because the risks that game developers imagine are very different from the risks that investors imagine. I get a lot of questions from people who are like, should we ask for $200,000, or is that too much money? And I ask them, who are you talking to? And they say, Microsoft. And I say, Microsoft spends more money than that on lunch for their global offices daily. If you just count the amount of people working there and you assume they spend a dollar on lunch per person, they're done. They can fund your game for that money. If everybody at Microsoft skips a sandwich for a day, they can fund your video game. So no, $200,000 is not a lot of money. What happens is $200,000 is a lot of money for you. It's a lot of money for me. Even after 10 years in this industry, the disconnect I have to create to accept that somebody goes and says $750,000, and I go, like, oh yeah, that seems, can we negotiate about that a little? Like, I don't think that's quite enough. And then being at home and being like, oh, this is very expensive cheese. It's a very odd feeling, but it's something that has to become second nature. You have to think like a business person. And when you think about it, when you think about your budget, and you think genuinely about your budget, it goes really fast. I don't know, what's the, what's the average salary for somebody working in the games industry? Does anybody know that it's in this region? Say like you spend like, uh, in the Netherlands it would probably be like 5,000, let's say 5,000 just for a simple, right? Uh, 5,000 euros. I don't know how the money here works, I'm very sorry. Um, 5,000 euros and you have four people, they're at 20,000, you do that for two years, well you can do the math, right? Budgets balloon really fast and one of the exercises I do most with small developers, students, is okay, let's just do the budget. And you know the amount of time I get, wow, that's more than I thought? I'm like, how is that more than you thought? I took the average salary, I multiplied it by the amount of people, and I multiplied it by the amount of months, and then I add 30%. That's the full trick. Just do that. That's your number, right? The problem is that a lot of people, when they, you know what, I'm going to keep this. Um, I need this for a transition in a few minutes. Um, the second thing, risk, right, what we talked about. Money is not as big of a risk as you think. The biggest risk with money you can bring to an investor is too little. If I come to you and I say, I'm going to sell you a car. It's a nice car, $25,000, uh, right? You might say, I can't afford that car. You might say, okay, can we do 15? Can we do 20, right? Maybe I can afford that. Maybe you say, that's just too much, it's out of my range, conversation's over. But you can negotiate down. Now if I come to you and I say, okay, I have a car for you, it's great, $12. How many of you are gonna continue that conversation? You try? Would you trust the car? You would trust that car. I have some great cars for you. Like, <laughs> they're this big, but I'll take $12. Um, one of the biggest risks you can bring to any investor is the money being too low. Because all that tells them is that you haven't thought about your business case. If you aim too high, sure, you might be arrogant. Sure, you might be asking too much. Sure, you might be trying to scam them a little. But it's business. I've done a deal where I got paid $30,000 where they were happy to pay a quarter million. And the only reason they paid me $30,000 is because I said $30,000. Which, I should have kept this for the failure slide, huh? Um, but, but the reality is that low is always riskier than high. The second risk that you have is people. 
If you're students, chances are you don't have any veteran people on your team. Chances are you don't have any senior people on your team, right? If you want to de-risk for that, the easiest thing to do is find somebody who is. Convince them to be part of your team and use their, their seniority, their experience as a vouch for your own. A lot of people go, well, how do I get a senior person? Well, let me tell you the biggest trick that I've already told you. You ask. The amount of student teams that I've talked with that say, I don't know how to get a senior person on board. And I said, well, how, do, how about you talk to that person? And I talk to that person and they go, would you want to be on board? And they're like, yeah, sure, this sounds great. It's huge. But a lot of people, when they come at game development, they don't believe that they can do that. The final thing is your opportunity. And your opportunity is not, and let me repeat this once more, you, the opportunity of your business, the opportunity of your investment is not a video game. It is a business case. It is the opportunity to make money or the opportunity to grow a brand. There are two things that I want you to keep in mind for opportunity. The first one is you never decide whether you're a good opportunity for somebody else. You pitch to everybody. You pitch to everybody that will listen to your pitch. And if they don't like it, they can tell you you're not a good fit. You don't go and say, Devolver is never going to publish my game. You don't go and say, Amplifier is never going to invest in my game. You don't say any of that. You just go to them and you talk to them. You let them say no. Do not say no to yourself. Do not self-filter. Because the amount of times that is the conversation where I go like, well, we pitched to three smaller publishers because we don't think we stand a chance with the bit like, what the fuck? You're making video games. You better believe in your own video game. If you don't believe to your, in your own video game enough to go talk to the biggest people in the room, what the hell are you doing? What's wrong? Is your game not good? Is your business case not sane? Did you not think things through? Of course your game is good enough. Why else are you making it? Why else did you go and decide that you were going to sit in this room? What kind of day is it today? A Thursday? It's a Thursday. Why are you sitting in a warm room under studio lights on Thursday listening to me yell at you if you didn't care about video games? Of course you care about video games. So talk to the biggest person in the room. I made a game called Ridiculous Fishing. There was a bunch of stuff that went down that I'll talk about on a later slide. I emailed the Washington, the Washington Post and the New York Times to be, hi, we have a story. It got published in both. It led to Apple knowing about our game and about our story and putting it on the front page of the Apple Store. I was angry. If I hadn't been angry, I wouldn't have sent that email. And it would have been the biggest mistake of my life to think that I was not big enough for those newspapers. Because I was. Of course I was. I wasn't a big deal. I hadn't done anything of note. This was the first hit game I would ever do. But you have to come at it with the idea that your game is worth it. So when it comes to initial funding, the thing I want you to keep in mind, make sure your business case is good, your budget is not too low, and you talk at people as if your game is worth it. Tone is incredibly important in pitch. The story you tell, the narrative, is incredibly important in a pitch. It is incredibly important in funding. If you get all that together, it's good. But if you don't believe in your game, damn, nobody will believe in it. And that brings us to imposter syndrome. I'm really happy with that transition. Oh my god. Wow. <laughs> imposter syndrome is a strange one. Because everybody has it. And the people that don't have it, still have it. The trick with imposter syndrome is that the problem with being creative in a field where there is an objective outcome of creativity, art being subjective, commercialization being objective, is that it creates an idea that you can be up here or down there with art. It gives the idea that you can be good or bad at art. It gives the idea that the people around you can be better or worse at art. Let me tell you one thing. If I was sitting in that chair today, and one of you was standing up here with 10 years of experience, then my chances in this industry would be pretty small. Because the reality is that it's a hard industry. 
It's a complicated industry. Let me tell you what the secret to my success was. The secret to my success is I made flash games. I made flash games at a time where people bought flash games. So if you want to be very successful, my best advice is to make flash games, apparently. Because that was true when I started. But if I was in that seat, I would have no advantage over you. There's no hidden wisdom or talent or whatever in me that makes it possible for me to be successful in games that you don't have. The thing that happened is I saw an opportunity. I took that opportunity. Part of that is, like I said, cultural upbringing, my dad teaching me that I have to make money. And this was in a time where Indy wasn't focused on money as much. So I had a little advantage, right? But there's no secret to this. The secret to this is game development is a coin flip. And the best you can do is prepare as well as possible so you have as many coins to flip when push comes to shove. You can be the best game developer in the world. You can do the best marketing in the world. You can have all your coins. You can have 20, 30 coins, and you can flip uh, like heads 20 times in a row and just not get it. And you can also do absolutely nothing and flip one coin and make the biggest hit in the universe, right? Imposter syndrome gives us an idea that there's a hierarchy. There's a better, there's a worse. The only way to look at this craft, the only way to look at this is relative to your own achievements. Try and be better than you were yesterday. That's all. Try to learn one new thing each week. Try to improve your craft time over time. Try to make those mistakes. Try to make those failures. Try to keep going. Imposter syndrome is tricky. And there's lots of documentation about it. There's lots of research into it, why it happens. It happens because we can only see the good stuff that the people around us are doing, and we don't see their bad stuff. And if you follow 100 people, 99 of them will have a bad day, but you will only see the one person that's having a good one. That's imposter syndrome, right? Imposter syndrome is you automatically being appealed to the idea of people that are better at something than you. Of course you follow great, if you're an artist, of course you follow some of the greatest artists on Twitter. But you're not that, you shouldn't be comparing yourself to that person. That person has been in games for 20 years and they would say the exact same thing. If they would start today, they would probably do worse work than you are doing right now. You know why? Because they didn't have them to learn from. Your biggest advantage is that there's people to learn from. That you can look at people that are doing the job that you're doing on Twitter, on Instagram, on uh, ArtStation, on whatever website you want to be on, uh, SoundCloud, Bandcamp, whatever, and you can learn from them. The biggest downside of that is that you can compare yourself to them from the start. Do not compare yourself to them. Take from them. Learn from them. Look at their techniques. Look at what they're doing. Listen to their talks, but don't try to be them. You will never be better at being them than they are. Be you and get better at being you. Compare yourself to a year ago, right? Look at the stuff you made six months ago. If you're better than that, you're not an imposter. If you're in this industry, you're not an imposter. Like I said, holy shit, who is here unless they want to be? I feel like an imposter every time I get on this stage. Who am I? I made some flash games, then I made a game about fishing with guns that made like lots of money. Now I'm supposed to tell you how to make games? Shit, I don't know. All I can tell you is that the things that I've learned is that there's nothing special about the people you look up to. They're people, and they struggle with the exact same feelings. One thing that I do think stands out about a lot of people that do good work in games is that they figured out how motivation works. And when they figured out how motivation works, I don't mean they're constantly motivated. They've come to terms with the fact that they are not. They've come to terms with the idea that creative work means that you sometimes have incredible productivity and you're making amazing stuff. And then the fact that you made amazing stuff will wreck your motivation for two years straight. Totally happens. If anybody in this room has made a hit game, I can guarantee you that they felt like shit for a period of time after it. Because then you have to make the next thing. And shit, that... Is that going to be as good? Am I as good? Was that a fluke? Was that? And then you have to make the next thing. You have to get started, right? 
A creative industry, which is the worst combination of words you can think of, a creative industry is a balance between motivation and discipline. It is a combination between being motivated and recognizing when you're motivated, so you can recognize when the work you're doing is of interest to you. It is making sure that if you start on something, that it is interesting enough to you as a human, that when you stop being motivated, you will finish it. But it's also discipline. And it's discipline to do the opposite. It's discipline to wake up and work on a game that you're no longer motivated in. It's discipline to walk away from a project if it's not going to work. Discipline is finishing a thing when you have something more interesting, which we all suck at. Let's be very honest. There's probably nobody in this room that's really good at that. Because there's always a shinier thing next door. There's always a shinier thing after this project. But the thing is, if you don't finish this project, you won't learn how to make that next project better. But the truth is also that if you keep working on this project, even though it's no, not going anywhere, then you'll never start on the next one. The only thing that I can with confidence say changes in 10 years of being in the games industry, besides the experience of failing over and over, is that you learn to understand that some projects, even though they seem great, will not work. And that some projects, even though you're not, no longer excited by them, deserve being finished. That's motivation. Motivation is not a magic solution. It's not a thing that people, rich people magically have because they say it in Forbes interviews. Motivation is a thing that you have and lose. It's a muscle. It can get overstretched. It can get tired. Do not search for the magical motivation. Just wake the fuck up and start working. And if you don't want to do that anymore, if a project is done, kill it, which might be even harder. Oh boy. Is this with bubbles? Shit. I'm talking too much. Stay hydrated, it's important. Healthy work environment. When we talk about motivation, when we talk about people making games because they want to, you immediately come to the most dangerous thing about this entire job. And the most dangerous thing about this entire job is that we care. And the most dangerous thing about us caring is that other people know we care. And the net result of that is that if there's a way to balance making money and keeping people safe, that too often in this industry, the balance will be slightly or extremely towards making money. That is not unique to games. That is not special about games. We are not worse than anybody else in games. We're just bad, horrible, don't get me wrong. But there is a movement to change that. There's also this magical idea that us indies are somehow really good at this. And let me tell you, fuck no. We're probably the worst. Because there's nobody to tell us that we have to go home or stop working. It's just us, right? In AAA, you're doing it for somebody else's benefit. So you're getting exploited. In indie, you're probably doing it for you or a small team of people. So you're hurting yourself. Either way, healthy work environments are far more complex than just saying work nine to five, right? And it's far more complex than saying, okay, four day work week. Healthy work environment starts with the simplest thing of all. Safety. Safety. Emotional safety, physical safety, mental safety. Making sure that people feel safe to make the choices they want to make, to communicate the worries they have, and to call things out when something needs to be held accountable or changed. Right? That's really where it starts. This whole idea of crunch is a problem because there is no way to hold the people accountable that make people crunch. The whole idea of crunch exists because there's no way to call out somebody who keeps working from 9 a.m. in the morning until midnight and therefore now owns 70% of the code base and I can't get rid of that person anymore because they wrote 70% of the fucking code base. Right? Crunch is insidious. It sneaks into things. It's not a thing. There's not a studio in the world that starts a studio and is like, you know what we're going to be? We're going to be the best crunchers on earth. Nobody starts like that. Everybody starts with, we're going to have a good team, we're going to make great games, we're going to go home at five, we're going to work for four days, we're going to have a weekend. And then it fucks up. 
And it fucks up because it fucks up slowly. It fucks up because one team will go, we're going to hit this deadline, and they will hit that deadline. And now the producer goes, well, they totally hit that. So when the next time they schedule it, they'll schedule that. And now they have to crunch again. And now they're tired, so they're not working as well. So now they're getting behind even further. So now another team is being blocked by the team that is being delayed. And now they have to work late in a shorter period of time because the other team is close to their deadline and didn't have enough time to do their work. And now everybody's crunching. Crunch never starts intentionally. Well, <laughs> crunch sometimes starts intentionally. Crunch mostly doesn't start intentionally. Crunch happens. And the only way to make sure that crunch doesn't happen or can't happen is creating systems where people feel safe and where people will be held accountable. The problem with that is that on the flip side is, does the studio survive? Will there be a job to feel safe at after this is over? Ideologically, I think it's very simple. Don't crunch. Financially, I've seen studios that took that decision and went under. So is this a simple question? No. But is there something you can do to make sure that this is handled well? Yeah. But it doesn't start with preventing crunch. It starts with making sure that people are safe, that they feel comfortable speaking up when something is bad, that they feel comfortable setting boundaries about when they go to work, and that if you're an indie, fucking track your hours. You should be doing this anyway, if you're a freelancer, if you're doing gigs, but like, please, for the love of God, know how much you're working, right? Because nobody will tell you not to work. You know, I used to think the answer to this was making video games. And I kind of realized that the best part of game development for me isn't video games anymore. I love video games. I love making video games. I love the feeling of making something work. I think the thing that really gets me is that we have this weird, complicated, probably the most complicated way of talking to other people, right? We're going to train a silicon chip with electricity to do stuff, and then we may game rules so that people can interact with it so we can tell them something. I know what you're telling them. Maybe you're, you're lying to them and saying that this high score really matters. It doesn't. You just got a higher number than previous time. Maybe you're telling them that this world is worth saving, which it's not. It's polygons, right? Maybe you're telling them that they're really good at racing. They're really good at pressing buttons on their keyboard. We're liars. We're very good professional liars. And we lie to people because we want people to feel something. And somewhere, at some point, I just started realizing that the people who choose to lie through video games, there's something really interesting there. And to me, I think the best part of game development has always been meeting other developers. It's always been hearing why people are doing this. It's always been trying to see what weird tricks we're pulling off to lie in more interesting ways. Right? It's learning about little tricks like uh, coyote time. You've all heard of coyote time? If anybody, is there anybody who hasn't heard of coyote time? Cool. I appreciate you raising your hand. Um, coyote time is a, it's a platformer effect. Uh, we use it in, in basic uh, physics. The basic idea is that if you have a platformer, usually what you do is when something wants to jump, you check whether it's connected to the ground. Right? And then if they press the bu pr jump button and you're on the ground, you jump. If you walk off a ledge, you fall. If you press jump, you shouldn't jump anymore because you're not connected to the ground anymore. But the reality is, that feels shitty. So very many platformer games will have a small period of time after which you leave the ground, but it will still allow you to jump. And what we are doing is we are cheating. We are cheating in favor of the player. Because the reality is, it doesn't matter whether the player is on the ground. Because you know what the truth is? The game doesn't matter all that much. And this is a weird thing. The way I always try to explain this is if, if games are a circle, a loop, you start with the player's mind, the intent. They have an idea of what the game is, and everybody has an idea, even before they start up your game. right? If you boot up uh, FIFA, and the EA Sports logo appears, what do you do? You press whatever button is skip, right? You press escape. Everybody hits escape at the publisher logos. That might work, it might not work. If it does work, it updates your mental model. You now know, I can press escape. 
right? Or whatever button it is on your, on your controller. Um, if it doesn't work, what do you do? You press spacebar or whatever button will hopefully skip the logo, right? Your mental model is continuously updating. It's updating all the time, right? You come into a game with certain expectations based on the marketing, based on the key art, based on what you've heard from other people, based on the genre, based on everything. All that comes into the game. And then based on that intent, you're going to press a button. You're going to do a input. Doesn't matter whether you're dancing in front of a connect or screaming into a microphone or smashing a button. Does not matter. You do an input. The input is processed in the game, the black box. You don't know what happens there, but the button gets processed. If you press the left button, character might move to the left. AI might have noticed that. There's fog of war. I don't know what your game is, but it gets processed. And then your game communicates back to the player through any method of output. Art, uh, sound, haptics, screaming back at the player. I don't know. Whatever it is, that goes back into the player's brain. And that creates a new intent. And the interesting thing about that is that the only place that the game is actually happening is in the player's head. As long as the player believes it, it's real. That's it. It doesn't matter what the game is doing. So when people say, like, oh, I want the game to be fair, I say bullshit. You want the game to feel fair, which very frequently means cheating on behalf of our players, because otherwise they feel it's unfair. Right? It is how when you roll a die in a video game, when you roll dice in a video game, you think most games actually roll like random six? Most games don't, because that would be really shit if you roll like seven ones in a row. And that's pretty possible, right? So I think the best part of game dev has always been finding how other people who approach this, who do this, find more creative ways of convincing people of things. I don't care what things are. Maybe it's the way something bounces. Maybe it's the way something walks. Maybe it's the way we tell a story or we do cutscenes or whatever. But the best part of game dev is that it isn't in our control. It's in the player's mind. And the way we interact with that is just infinitely fascinating to me. And I think I'm going to be fascinating that for the rest of my life. I literally don't know how to transition here, so I'm just going to press the button and we'll go from there. Can I, uh, who, who said scripting? Can I ask what you want to know about scripting? How you approach scripting. I mean, scripting is an interesting one. It, it, you can define it as like completely distinct from programming, right? Like it, it, there's discussion about what scripting, what programming is. I think the bigger question is what are what is your perp what what are you what are you using scripting for? Yeah, no, I mean, this becomes kind of a complicated thing because there's definitions and different definitions of what is what. I think scripting as as a tool within existing programming languages or tool sets, which if you define it as not directly on the programming layer of stuff. It can be very powerful. Visual scripting, for example, it can be one of the most powerful tools. And I think one of the most powerful tools, the reason it's one of the most powerful tools you have is that we have such a multidisciplinary field that communicating between different types of professionals can get really confusing, right? And anything that helps bridge that gap, I think, is really important as a tool. And scripting it can be an incredibly powerful design tool, it can be an incre incredibly powerful prototyping tool. Uh, compared to just having to sit down and start with an empty like C sharp or C++ project. Um, if you don't mind, can I hop off of that in a direction that I think might be valuable to talk about? And then I'll answer any specific questions if you have them afterwards. Cool. One of the things, if you're a small team, one of the things that I think can be really important is that you recognize that everybody in your team speaks a different language. Right? Your programmers speak a different language than your artists speak a different language than your designers speak a different language than your business people speak a different language than your narrative designers. Is this one flavored? It's, oh, okay, it's lemon flavored. How did I notice that only now? Um, when you try to communicate between your teams, my challenge to you would be to always try and communicate in the language of the person you're talking to. And that sounds a little complicated, but it basically means that if you have a sound and you're talking to your sound engineer, 
uh, sound mixer, sorry about this. Um, if, if you have a sound and you're like, no, no, I don't want it to sound like I want it to sound like then you just do that. Please don't go like, no, we need more rumble, like a little bit more like, just you use, your, use whatever facilities you have to communicate, right? Whether that's like gesticulating wildly, whether that is writing a thing, whether it's drawing a flowchart, whether it's trying to prototype something in Game Maker or Construct or whatever it is that you can work in, whatever version of communication you have that is closest to what they do is best. Now, the thing I don't want you to do is try and learn how to do like musical notation to talk with a composer. Use whatever the shortest way is to communicate in their language. Because a lot of people also don't like when you try to do their job for them. Right? So you kind of want to find a middle ground where you speak to people in their own language without trying to sound prescriptive as how they should do their job. Communication takes practice. It's probably the most complicated thing about game development that you will learn. And it is the thing that gets taught least in school. Which I think is a good hop here. Um, I've told you about one failure, which was a negotiation failure. I think how long it took me to understand that communication is probably the biggest strength that you can have as a creator, as a creative in a multidisciplinary team, probably my second biggest fuck up. I believed that game development was about programming, because I was a coder. And it made me an unsufferable asshole for the first year of my career, because I thought it was about code. I thought games should be games. I thought narrative was bullshit. Apologies, sorry. Um, I, I believed everything had to be because of the code. If it wasn't necessary for the code, it wasn't, it wasn't important. And then I made a video game, and the first video game I made was all about feedback, right? It was about sprites, it was about the sound, it was about how it all came together. Super Crate Box was IGF nominated, um, but it was all about communication. Actually, one of the people somewhere in this room gave a talk about uh, juice, feedback, right? And that talk was eye-opening back in the days, because it stopped the idea that it's about the computer. It's not about the computer, it's about the people. In your team, the same is true. It's about the people. Making games is about the people. It's just about the people. It is not about anything else. You can make a great game without a computer, just fine. You can do it without a programmer. You can do it without an artist. You can do it without a sound designer. You can make games whatever way you want, right? If you are working with those disciplines, though, you have to learn how to communicate. Your soft skill of being a nice, kind person, an understanding person, a person that can give feedback, a person that can communicate, a person that gives feedback to people at a time where it's appropriate, that asks whether they're okay to give feedback, right? Those are skills that are incredibly important. Your ability to summarize your brilliant design into such a way that a programmer can look at it and go like, oh yeah, I see how to do that. That's an important skill. Your ability to communicate, in fact, is so important that it permeates through every part of a game developer, no matter what type of game developer you are. Are you an indie? Learn to communicate. You know why? Because you can't write your marketing if you don't learn how to communicate. You think you can pitch to a publisher without knowing how to communicate the value of your game? Of course not. You think in a team you can tell an artist that you want something slightly different? If you're just an asshole about things all the time, no, of course not. They're just going to stop caring. They're going to leave. You think you can put together a business case without communicating? No, everything, every single part of our job is being a human. And it's being a group of human with completely different interests with one shared thing, which is that they like to make games. Which is why when you play a Zelda tune, it works in this room. But as soon as you try to talk a little bit more in depth, you're going to find that everybody speaks different languages, right? Trying to bridge those languages, trying to be a good person, trying to figure out how to be a kind person, a welcoming person, a constructive person, those are the skills that are going to get you a job in the games industry. Being a good programmer? Fuck, how many good programmers are in this room? Like, probably like 20, right? If I was looking for a good programmer, 
I'll just hire a good programmer. I'm not going to hire the best programmer. I'm going to hire the programmer that seems like the nicest person that will work well with my team, that will not end up demotivating the team by being terrible all the time. And that seems like they are eager to learn and are excited to learn. And part of that is communicating, right? I don't know. I'm currently playing Metroid Dread. I think it's really good. I really love the uh, Nier Automata. It's really uh, impactful. There's this game called 13 Sentinel Aegis Rim that I played last year that I really loved, even though it was a little odd. But I think my favorite game, okay, my favorite game has to be Final Fantasy XV. And it's for one very simple reason. It's the first game my mom played. My mom secretly read the game's news for 10 years as I traveled the world so that when I would come home, she didn't have to like ask about all my work stuff. And at some point I realized, because I said, I visited Phil and my mom went like, which one? I'm like, what do you mean, which one? She's like, well, Spencer, Fish, Tibetowski. I'm like, how do you know all these names? She's like, I read your Facebook. I'm like, I don't think I've talked about Phil Spencer on my Facebook. She's like, I read the game's news. I'm like, you read the game. And so I just kind of talked with her about video games and realized that she knows everything. She's like well read on video games. And I just went like, did you ever play a video game? She's like, no. I'm like, okay, let me get you, let me get you a console. We'll hook, we'll hook you up with a game. And I asked her what kind of game does she, does she want? And she's like, I like Lord of the Rings. So I looked at uh, Shadow of Mortar or Shadow of War. And uh, just like the first seconds of it was like gruesome execution. So I'm like, okay, maybe not that one. Uh, and then I found that, the th I asked my mom like, why Lord of the Rings? And she's like, oh, I just like the story of like Frodo and Sam and they're going up against like Satan. And I'm like, I think Final Fantasy 15 is kind of like that. So I, she played Final Fantasy 15 and the accessibility modes were great. Uh, you could not game over in that game if you put it on easy. Uh, lots of open spaces to practice the dual stick which, with, which she never played dual stick, no platforming, which was awesome. Uh, everybody kept saying like, why don't you let her play Journey? I'm like, that's a precision platformer with implied goals. It doesn't go, go there, it goes like, there's a mountain. I showed my mom, she's like, cool. So where do I go? I'm like, to, okay, not this game. Um, a lot of things that we think are sensible are not sensible. They're just trained. When we see a crack in a wall, we go, oh my God, treasure. When my mom saw a crack in a wall, she went, should I get out of this building? It seems unsafe. Um, there's an antagonist in, uh, how much time do I have? I don't have a clock. Uh, do I have time? Five minutes, oh God. Um, the antagonist in Final Fantasy XV wears a long black jacket, a slightly crooked hat, has purple hair, and has like a uh, clearly Japanese semi-antagonist vibes. Uh, like the, the, even the tune is kind of like a da 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 where the lost Joan is just kind of like clearly discordant. Um, and he speaks with like a sneer, like kind of with his head back like that. I was like, when mom's going to meet this character, I want to know if she's reading the vibe, right? If she's understanding the language that's being presented to her. So I get a text message from her and, I'm, and she's like, Rami, I took a very long walk to Golden Key. I'm like, walk? She's like, I couldn't find the car. I'm like, how long is that walk? She's like, 25, 30 minutes or something. I'm like, you know, there's a button to get your car, right? She's like, no. Uh, anyway, I met a guy and he was kind of creepy. And I go, what was creepy about him? Because Golden Key is where you meet this semi-antagonist. And uh, she says, yeah, no, um, he was wearing all black. I'm like, right. She's like, and I walked up to him. I'm like, right. She's like, and then he tried to sell me guns. I'm like, wait, what? Like, yeah, he tried to, like, he, he had swords and guns. I just, I ran away. I didn't trust it. Like, so I booted up Final Fantasy 15, and right before the trigger line, where that cutscene starts playing, is a shopkeeper. And my mom had run into the shopkeeper, and it's gone like, hi. And the guys went like, guns? And I was like, well. <laughs> we have been trained to understand that all these things are supposed to be how it works. 
they do not make sense. And the more I've watched my mom play video games, the more I've realized just how much information is in our head about how things are supposed to work in video games. So maybe it's Final Fantasy XV, just because that connection between me and mom. She's still playing games. She's currently finishing Mass Effect 3. She's played God of War. She's done Persona 5. She's been to space in video games. Uh, she's, she's been having a great time, but that connection I will always cherish, so that game I will always cherish. I just talked a bit about getting into the industry, and again, I want to emphasize this one more time. Your hard skills, your ability to do good work, is critically important. Absolutely. It is also the absolute baseline. It is the bottom. The base assumption of you applying to any games company in the world is that you can do the work. The good news is most of you will be able to do the work. Most of you are capable of getting to that level even when you currently are not. And what we are looking for when we hire in the games industry is not necessarily a person who can already do the job. It is somebody who we can see has the attitude, and the potential for growth, and the communication style to do that. Now, the problem with that is that there's not that many jobs and a lot of you, right? Which means that communicating your potential clearly is one of the most critical things you will have to learn. And that is not something you have to get right in one go either. You iterate on this as you go. Apply to things. If you don't get responses, see if there's a way that you might be uh, mislabeling yourself. I had a, a really interesting case from somebody who had been applying to jobs for a long time. She had introduced herself as a concept artist, but the work she'd been doing up until that point was in another studio where they weren't, just, they weren't valuing her work. And she was basically acting as an art director, just not paid or titled as an art director. And I said, just put art director on your portfolio. And she did. And she got hired within two weeks. Right? Presenting yourself as what you are, and I'm not telling you to, tell, to sell yourself as an art director if you're not, by the way. I'm telling you to present yourself as you are is important. Thinking of what a studio wants from you is important. And what we want from you is a quick and easy way to evaluate if you're the right fit. Which means that please don't make a portfolio that's 75 pages long, but also please don't make a portfolio where you just put a bunch of projects and go like, well, this is what I made. Because I don't know what you did on that. I don't know why you did on that. I don't know what this means about you. Yes, there's a cool little flying game. Cool. I don't know if I should hire you, right? There's no good answer to this because every company is different. Every company's needs are different. Every company's situation is different. But the most important thing is that you learn to communicate you. If you're unsure about whether you're doing good work, find somebody at the company that you're applying to and just send them your portfolio and ask. Right? Like I said, the best thing you can do is ask. And if there's a specific studio we want to work at, send them an email. Ping them on Twitter. The 90% of them won't reply. That's fine. Just don't be an asshole about it. Please do not send for the sixth time. Please. If somebody doesn't respond, take the hint. Right? Um, but just messaging once is not, a, is not a faux pas for most people. If it is for somebody, you will probably get a vibe from it uh, over on Twitter or wherever you're reaching out. Just don't, don't steal people's shit. Just please. Um, and this is an industry about inspiration, about learning from each other. It's an industry about... It's a very transparent industry, honestly. Like, it's a, a transparency where people talk about their work, they talk about what they want to do. We might not be able to do it publicly, right? NDAs, blah, blah, all that. Uh, let me reassure you, like, the average conversation in the games industry is on friend DA level, where we all know that this is NDA, but we're just going to talk about it anyway, right? Uh, I can't do that here on stage, because I don't know if this is being recorded or streamed or anything, but friend DA is sort of like the basic assumption uh, for many things. Rewards people's trust with trust, right? Don't go talking about something somebody else told you. Don't go stealing somebody else's design. Don't go taking away some of their pitch lines or their marketing material or go like, oh, wow, that's really cool. Let's take that art style. Like, it's okay to be inspired. Please be inspired. Please be inspired by all the cool stuff that you see. Take what is valuable. Take what is interesting. Take what speaks to you, what fits your toolbox. Learn. If you're new to our industry, take. Don't worry about giving back yet. There will be a time where you're in this industry, 
you've done something that is valuable to people, and you'll be able to share what you've learned. You'll be able to share what you've done, and you'll be able to share the results of that. Do not worry about that. Take, learn, ask, reach out. It is okay. There's no secret background balance where we're weighing how much you've taken to make sure that you give enough back right now. Be kind, be inquisitive, and make cool stuff. Let's go. Thank you. I do have time yeah. for questions. I do have time for questions. Woo! Any quick questions? Okay, let's rapid fire. Go. The mic? Oh, they need a mic. All right, if you have any questions, just run to the mic, we'll rapid fire them. Uh, what happened to Vlambeer? Why did you close it down? We closed it down because we had nothing left to say. That's really it. Like the two of us, we were a statement studio. We liked doing things that felt like they were important and we had nothing important left to say. At the start, it was two, two guys that dropped out of school can start an indie studio. After, oh cool. After that, it was uh, uh, you can make games for mobile. After that, it was you can make games for console. And then it was you can continue existing if you exist. And we didn't feel that was a very valuable thing. So we made a last statement, which is you can quit while you're ahead, which I actually thought was a really cool last statement for a studio. Um, do you have a strategy to uh, separate work and relaxation? What? Do you have a strategy for separating work and relaxation? Actually, uh, it, it's kind of harsh, my strategy. Uh, my strategy is I play games for two hours a day, and I count that as work. And then uh, after that, I do not do anything work anymore. Uh, I picked up some hobbies because I was home. So I've picked up aviation again, and I'm trying to learn piano again. Uh, two things that I've started on and then just dropped because video games happened. Um, it took me 10 years to figure this out. Uh, and I don't think I've gotten it down just yet. But being really strict with myself has, has made a difference. Cool. I think we're out. We're out. If anybody has any other questions that they want to ask in the room, please just find me somewhere, anywhere. I'll be around. Uh, feel free to come say hi. And it was an absolute pleasure. Thank you. The pleasure is ours. Rami. I think that you have inspired everybody to go home and play a game with their mom. And I think that, that's a good deed. That's a good deed. We want more mom players. All right, folks. Um, this is going to be a hard act to follow, but watch us, watch us, because now we're going to the heart of the matter, the current challenges of startup.